If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 45. Genesis chapter 45. Is anybody glad that the fast is over? It is over. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I think they should call it slow instead of fast because it goes so slow. Nothing fast about a fast. Genesis chapter 45. Genesis chapter 45. I want to kind of wrap up our series on the eagle uh, today. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? By it. But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, please come near to me. So they came near. And then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not go or do therefore do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years, the famine has been in the land and there are still five years in which there will ne neither be plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to the Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hurry, go to my father, say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not tarry. You know, I think this has got to be one of the most powerful um, stories of forgiveness in all of the Bible. You know, the idea of, of being devastated in the way Joseph had been and coming to this place where he could show that level of forgiveness, I think is an example for every single person in this room. The title of my message today uh, is a unique one. Everybody say, Pop Goes the Weasel. I'm gonna do it instead of drop, I'm gonna call it Drop Goes the Weasel. Drop Goes the Weasel, not Pop Goes the Weasel. Anybody enjoy 80s music in here? In that, in that 80s, isn't that like an 80s anthem, pop goes? I don't even know what it means. I'm afraid to <laughs> imagine what it means. Um, drop the weasel. There's a story I heard years ago. T.D. Jakes uh, preached this, this message. And I remember different parts of the story. But it was the story of a hunter who was watching this eagle as it began to, in a full dive at 187 miles an hour, hit this prey and begin to fly upwards and he recognized that the prey that the eagle had grabbed a hold of was a weasel. And as the eagle begins to soar, he can notice that there's a fight, there's a battle going on between the eagle and the weasel. The weasel's not giving up very easily. And before he knew it, it he said it was the most random thing. He said that eagle began to flail through the air and he said, I watched as it hit the ground. He said, I was so curious what, what could have possibly happened to this eagle to make it suddenly fall out of the sky like that. He said, I, I looked everywhere I could until I finally found that eagle. And when I found it, sure enough, it was laying dead on the ground. He said, I imagined in my mind that surely that eagle had fallen all that way. And if it had killed the eagle, surely it had killed the weasel as well. He said, so I went and I pushed over the body of that eagle and the weasel was nowhere to be found. And when I turned the body over, the hunter said, what I noticed is that there was a huge hole in the, catch, the chest cavity of that eagle. And he said, I recognized what had happened was that weasel had begun to chew his way through the chest cavity of the eagle and eventually got to his heart and bit that eagle's heart, killing the eagle. I say this because the eagle's talons are incredibly strong. The eagle's talons are known for their ability to, to literally crush whatever they get a hold of. Literally, a eagle's talon could crush the bones in your leg. It's incredibly strong. So here's this eagle. He's, he's got this prey. He's, he's soaring upwards. 
But as he's, as he's soaring, that, that weasel begins to chew away at his chest. All the eagle has to do, in spite of how strong he is, in spite of how capable he is, all he has to do is drop that weasel and he can fly. But because he hangs on to it, it ends up eating his heart. I think so many believers are guilty of this. So many believers, it's not that they don't have potential, it's not that they don't have gifting, it's not that they're, they're not incredibly strong, but somewhere along the way, they pick some things up. And as a result, those things have a way, if they'll just let them go, they can move forward into life, they can preserve their heart, they can preserve their love for God, their love for the things of God, their love for, for people, but so many times they just hang on to those things and those things have a way of gnawing their way through and chewing and devouring our heart for life and for the things of God. Mark chapter 11, verse 25 says, forgive if you have any ought against any. You know, forgiveness is a painful thing. It hurts to kiss revenge goodbye. It hurts to believe that someone is getting away with something that they've done to us. It's difficult to accept in our hearts that someone can be blessed without any consequence that is imposed by us because of something they've done to us. But what we know is that healing always follows forgiveness. There are so many things that, that God wants to do in our life, but, but for whatever reason, we just can't let go of some things. If we're going to soar in 2017, if we're, if we're truly going to go to new heights in 2017, if you're going to go to new levels in God, you first of all have to ask yourself, are there some things that I have grabbed a hold of in 2016 or before that, that I've just allowed to begin to find their way through to my heart? And every time I try to go up and every time I try to move forward, every time I try to say yes to God in this area of my life, the unfortunate thing is I just keep finding myself falling back to the ground because of those things I cannot let go of. I think Joseph is a beautiful example to us of how we drop the weasel. The Bible here in Genesis chapter 45 is happening 22 years after Joseph has been sold into slavery. 22 years has gone by. He's gone through all the things that he's gone through. He went through not just the betrayal of his brothers and multiple setbacks and imprisoned, he finds himself now elevating up to be the second in command over the entire nation. He is literally, he says it here, he is considered the Lord over all of Egypt. He's the prime minister of all of this mighty nation. And randomly to Joseph, his brothers find their way into the courtyard where he's sitting on his throne. Joseph recognizes his brothers, but his brothers have not quite recognized who Joseph is. All around Joseph are his guards. All around Joseph are, are people that, that, are, that are there, and his brothers find their way into that courtyard, and they have an audience with their brother. And as Joseph recognizes who they are, before he reveals himself, he makes a decision to 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 tell everyone that is there, all the guards, all the protectors, all those who are there, he asked them all to leave because he knows that he's about to have a conversation with his brothers where he's going to reveal who he is and in revealing who he is, there's no way to not then go back and discuss not only that they betrayed him, not only did they try to murder him, ultimately throw him into uh, to, to that pit and sell him into slavery in their minds, just leaving him to end up live, living a, a horrible life and probably end up being killed. All of this had happened. Joseph knew the conversation was about to happen between him and his brothers concerning all that what they did had done to his life. And Joseph makes a decision. Hey, I want everybody to leave except me and my brothers. In other words, if you look at Joseph and you look at how greatly he was wronged, but yet he found forgiveness, the first thing that we find Joseph does is he didn't go around telling everybody about what happened. Think about that. Joseph had everyone leave the room but his brothers. He made a decision, you and I are going to discuss this. 
Most of the time, the reason that we hang on to something and, and uh, the more you talk about what someone's done to you, you know what? That's evidence that you're hanging on to the weasel. You're hanging on to that thing. You're, you're letting it. And, and the reason we talk about those things is really to punish the other person. In our minds, we want them to suffer for what they've done. And every time we bring it up and every time we discuss it and every time we rehash it, rehearse it and go over it and over it and over it again, what we're doing in our minds is we're making the other person suffer. But the opposite is true. What's actually happening is that thing is, is chewing its way into our heart, into who God wants us to be. He's, that, that thing is finding its way, and it's not hurting them. It's actually hurting us. Two things happen when we decide to keep rehearsing things. Number one, you step into God's territory. Nahum 1 and verse 3 says, God will not acquit the wicked. In other words, if someone has done something to you and it needs to be dealt with, God can do a better job at dealing with them than you can. And every time you pick that weasel up, that unforgiveness, that issue up, you know what you're doing? You're telling God, I think I can handle it better than you can. The Bible says, God lets us know vengeance is mine. I will repay. In other words, sometimes you just gotta say, God, I don't know what the person needs, but I trust you to handle it. The second thing that happens is we set the standard for our own judgment. Matthew 7, 2, and it says in the same way you judge someone else, you'll be judged in that same way. In other words, when you and I begin to just go over something and over something, the second you just choose to drop it, you just choose to say, here, God, I'm going to give it to you. You do what you need to do. You handle it how you want to handle it. My responsibility is to no longer give that thing power in my life, no longer to give it access to my heart and to, to, to my love for you and for life and for people. So I'm going to go ahead and drop it and I'm going to show grace. And every time you do that, what you do is you set the standard for your own judgment because in the same way you measured that out, it's measured back to you. So you measure out that, that talking about it and, and, and causing them to suffer and you're gonna get them with your words and you're gonna pay them back with your words and you're gonna tell everybody. The more you do that, guess what? That's what the same way is gonna be measured back to you. But if you sow forgiveness and you sow mercy and you say, God, I'm gonna give them to you, I'm gonna let it go, guess what? That's the same way, that's the judgment that's measured back to you. I don't know about you, but I wanna drop the weasel in 2017 and I want my measure to be a measure of grace and forgiveness from God. The second thing that Joseph did, verse three and four, is we find out Joseph did not intimidate. The Bible here says that his brothers were afraid. I can only imagine the moment everyone left the room and he looked at him and he, said, and he says, hey, I know I've grown up, 22 years has passed by, I'm Joseph. I can imagine that moment where his brothers recognized who he is, who he was. The shock soon set in and they were afraid. They thought to themselves, it's over. And Joseph had their life in his hands. Yet he didn't use his position in his platform to make them fear and be afraid, filled with threats. No, he didn't do that. Joseph did something so interesting he said to them, hey, listen, come close to me. I want you to come close. I want you to come close. And the Bible here says as they come close that he's actually crying. In other words, he wants them to see not fear. He wants them to not feel intimidated. He's not wanting to manipulate him through some kind of threat, ultimatum, if you will. No, this is what he's doing. He's simply looking at them. And as they're watching him, as they get closer, they're actually able to see tears of compassion streaming down their brother's face for them. It's an amazing thing how, how many times we, we just we get a hold of something, something happens to us, and we just cannot let it go. And, and, and in our minds, we're just thinking about how we're going to get them and how, how dare. And, and we just, we, we, know, we know it's eating us up. We, we know it's devouring our mind. It's devouring our peace. It's, it's taking our joy. We know it is. But so many times we just, have, we just hang on to those things and, we, and, and, and for some, some way we think that, that that's, that's actually helping the situation by intimidating those who have wronged us. 
You know, I think about how here we find that it took Joseph 22 years to get to this point. In other words, he didn't get to this point where he could show this level of forgiveness overnight. Didn't happen in one day, didn't happen in a year, probably didn't happen in the first decade. But over time, Joseph got there, which lets us know, hey, listen, if you're here today and you say, Marcus, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what they did to me. You don't know how I've been hurt. If you had faced what I've faced, you wouldn't be preaching this kind of sermon. No, I understand. And I may not completely get it. And I may not completely understand it. And I may not understand the level of forgiveness God's calling you to. But what I do understand without any question is that in time, no matter how severe it is, it might take you 22 years to get there. But it is possible for you to get to that place where that thing no longer is devouring your heart, your zest, your passion, your zeal for life, for God, and for the things of God, you can get to that place where you let that thing go and you drop that thing in 2017. Joseph doesn't stop there. As they come close to him, in verse five, he looks at them and he says, do not be angry with yourselves. In other words, Joseph doesn't guilt trip his brothers. That's incredible. It's incredible that Joseph has experienced this level of pain, this level of betrayal. He's experienced losing everything that he had ever had because of what his brothers had done to him. But yet he has the ability to sense the biggest hurdle they're probably going to face is self-forgiveness. And so Joseph is, without question, we get why God raised him up. We get why why Joseph was in the position that he's in. We understand it now. Because Joseph has the opportunity to guilt trip his brothers, but he does the opposite. He starts introducing them to the idea of forgiving themselves. Because I'm just imagining over the years that, that they had regrets I'm imagining over the years, maybe it was in private moments, maybe it was away from one another where they begin to think about what they had done, how they, in their minds, their little brother had probably been killed or even worse, and and that they had regrets. And and Joseph knew how difficult it probably was to to carry that for 22 years. And so he looks at him, he says, man, don't beat yourselves up over this. One of, the, one of the most difficult things we can do is just say, man, I've got to learn to forgive myself and let some things go. Paul, the apostle in Galatians 1 and verse 13 said, I wasted the church. Think about it. He's preaching to the church in, in the Galatian church. And as he's preaching to them in the audience, we know that Paul, the apostle, went and murdered Christians before he became a Christian. And so he's in the Galatian church and he's looking around and he's looking at widows and he's looking at orphans. He's looking at children that don't have their parents, wives that don't have their husbands. He's, he's, he's looking at this situation and as he's preaching to them, he's thinking to himself, I'm the one that put them in this situation. I'm the one that caused them to have to live in this place. Their their tears, their sadness, their grief, their mourning, their, their difficulties in life. All of that is because of me. And Paul says, I wasted the church. In Romans 7, 24, he says, who will deliver me from this body of death? It's an ancient Persian uh, expression that represents when a person murders someone, they would punish the murderer by chaining the victim to that person's back. So every, where that person went, the body was chained to them. Over time, the body began to decompose and the aroma of death, everywhere that person went, they would inhale the aroma of death. Not only did they inhale the aroma of death, but eventually the same way that 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 dead body's flesh was dying and decomposing and being eaten, eventually it would begin to also attach the flesh of the living person and eventually end up killing the person as they carried the weighty body of their victim around. And Paul said, who will deliver me from this body of death? What he was admitting is the weight of guilt. What he was admitting is that guilt is extremely heavy. Shame will will drag you down. 
It's, it's an aroma that fills every part of your life. You cannot get away from you. It will shorten your life because you're not built to carry it. And so Paul gets to this place and he's, he's letting us know, hey, listen, we're not wired to carry these things for our whole life. And I love that Joseph looks at them and he says, listen, we might grieve. You, you, you might beat yourself up. You, you might have to, 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 to show yourself some compassion. But what he lets them know is you cannot move forward. We cannot move forward if you keep carrying this thing around. You're gonna have to bury it and you're going to have to move on. When you and I forgive someone, we give them permission to move on. We give them permission to quit beating themselves up. We give them permission to quit having to go through it. And Joseph was able to say, hey, listen, I know a key to forgiveness is, is, is me not just letting it go, but me finding ways to even release them and help them let go of that thing so they don't, I, I, it's one thing to have to forgive somebody else. It's a totally different thing to forgive yourself. But in 2017, if you and I are going to soar, we're going to have to learn the importance of self-forgiveness. Verse four, or number four, verse eight, Joseph says, it wasn't you who sent me here, but God. In other words, Joseph said to his brothers, I'm going to let you save face. Think about this. Joseph says to his brothers, what you did is God. What you did to me, God was in it. What? Joseph, in all this position and influence, have you started smoking weed? <laughs> Think about it. He's saying, what you did, I found God in it a whole nother level of forgiveness, is it not? I believe what happens when you go through a significant event where you're wounded by someone is it teaches you and it gives you a revelation of how much God has forgiven you. And it also lets you and I know that forgiveness is not an easy thing. Forgiveness did not come cheap. It's not like God's up in heaven. He just said, oh, here you go. Let's sprinkle some fairy dust of forgiveness. No, to show us forgiveness, he sent his son who paid a horrible price to let us know what forgiveness looks like. It's bloody, it's messy, it's hurtful, it's painful, all kind of things. To, and when we, when we look at what someone has done to us and the pain that it's caused us, and then we have to be honest with ourselves and say how much more God has forgiven us. It teaches us what forgiveness from God is really like. It shows us how God ultimately is always at work in the big picture. No matter what happens, it has to pass through the hand of God before it gets to you and I. And when we come through it, we can get to the other side of it. Like Joseph saying to those around us that, that I've really come to the place. It's not me being fake. It's not, I've really come to the place where in spite of what you have done to me, somehow it really ultimately wasn't you because I found God in all of that. And Joseph says, what you meant for evil against me, God meant it for my good. Number five in verse nine, I love this one. This is so good, I'm almost done. Go up to my father and say to him, thus saith thy son, Joseph. The next thing that Joseph does for his brothers is he protects them from their greatest fear. His brothers have watched their father Jacob for 22 years believe that his son was dead. His brothers not only betrayed him, but they stripped him of that coat of many colors, that coat of favor. They dipped it in that animal blood and they handed that bloody coat to their father. And for 22 years, every single one of them had to keep, 
they had to keep lying to Jacob. As he mourned, as he cried, as he was devastated by the loss of his youngest son, they had to walk for year after year after year. And anyone who's ever faced incredible loss can say it's not something you ever get over. And those brothers would have known that that moment changed their father forever, that they had the ability to completely release their father from his pain, but they refused to do it. And now they're standing in Joseph's presence and he's alive and he's saying to go talk to my father, Jacob, and tell him that I'm, a, tell him that I'm alive. And his brothers are afraid they're going to have to go back and say to him for 22 years, we've lied to you. For 22 years, we've watched you grieve and watch. They think that they're going to have to go tell their father. But Joseph makes a decision with his brothers. And he says, you're never going to have to tell Jacob, our father, what has happened. What happened is between you and me. Think about that. Joseph says there's no value in a third party that's innocent being pulled into the details. He was protecting his father from pain of being pulled into a, an offense that even though it affected him, Joseph knew that the best thing that he could do from, with, for his father was protect him from the thing that was between him and his brothers. How much better would our life be if people weren't always trying to pull us into their offenses? Children getting pulled into issues with parents. It's unfortunate. People in church getting pulled into things that, that cra it's just crazy, the kind of things people get dragged into. And, and the truth of the matter is, most of the time, it's, it's, it's someone trying to pull somebody else in and there is no value in it. Many times we say, oh no, I, I, I just believe other people need to, need to know about it. No, that's not what you're doing. You're trying to see how much support you can get by telling the partial side of your story and asking them to know, don't tell their side. Do we, don't look, and what, what, what are you truly doing? You're truly trying to get, at, to justify the fact that truly you're walking in unforgiveness. You're letting that thing devour your heart. And in your mind, you're hurting them. But guess what? That hunter walked up to that eagle and that weasel ran away. That, easel, that weasel was unaffected. But that eagle's heart had been devoured. Again, sometimes you just have to have the courage to say, you know what? This is between me and them. I'm gonna talk to them about it. And as far as anything else goes, it's in the ground, it's buried. I'm not gonna drag it up. I'm not gonna bring it up. I'm not spreading it. I'm not discussing it. I'm not talking about it. If me and them can't Matthew 18 it and deal with it, we're dropping it. It's good preaching right there. Good, amen, amen. There you go, it's so good. Have you ever thought about why Solomon's temple was destroyed, this beautiful piece of architecture? Did you know that Solomon's temple in the city of Jerusalem should have been preserved? That Nebuchadnezzar was going to destroy the city of Jerusalem and ultimately destroy Solomon's temple? And Jeremiah, the prophet, came and told King Zedekiah, if you'll let the slaves go, if you'll let them go, I'll change the heart of Nebuchadnezzar and he'll turn around and Jerusalem won't be destroyed. And so the king does what Jeremiah says. He lets all the slaves go. He lets all the prisoners go. And King Nebuchadnezzar hears about it. It changes his heart and he turns around and he's leaving. Jerusalem has been freed from, in, you know, no question they would have been completely destroyed. And then Jeremiah changes his mind. And he says, I want you to go and recapture the prisoners and recapture the slaves, and I want you to bring them back. And now he brings all the people that he had just let go back, and King Nebuchadnezzar hears about it, and it intensifies his anger. And he comes back, and he destroys Jerusalem, destroys Solomon's temple, and you have an entire book in your Bible that is written to discuss what happens when you change your mind on forgiveness. It's called the Book of Lamentations. It's a book of sadness and remorse. 
Because people have a tendency to say, I'll forgive one day, not the next day. I forgive here, but don't forgive there. I'm not saying it's not difficult, but what I'm saying is there's a lot of things that happen in people's lives that are hard to let go of. But one thing that you cannot afford is you cannot afford to change your mind on forgiveness. Did you know the Bible goes to the extreme? We talk about the unforgivable sin, the sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. You know, okay, fine, take that. But there's another unforgivable sin. Read the Bible. It's when you choose unforgiveness. Jesus said, if you don't forgive, I don't forgive you. The Bible actually tells a parable of a wealthy king who who had a man who owed owed him 10,000 talents. That's 10 million US dollars. And the man forgives the man of his debt, lets him go out of prison. He runs into a guy that that owes him one pence, which is like, like a couple dollars. And the guy enslaves him for a couple dollars when he's just been forgiven a $10 million debt. And when the wealthy king hears about it, he says, I want you to go and I want you to imprison him again. And Jesus says in that parable, so God does likewise to us when he's forgiven us of this this innumerable, immeasurable debt. But then we go and we get hung up on these little things along the way. No matter how big we make them, they're little compared to the forgiveness he's shown us. And they'll eat away at our heart. I think ultimately forgiveness is God's just way of saying, hey, preserve your heart. You're never going to kill the weasel hanging on to that. Just drop it so you can soar in 2017. I'm almost done. Genesis 50 and verse 21. It's a quiet church today. He reassured them. He spoke kindly to them. Joseph made a lifelong commitment to them. Think about this. He lets them know, I'm going to take care of you and your family. He says it like this. God has done all of this so I can preserve your posterity. So generations can be blessed. That's why God has raised me up to where I am. And that's why I'm gonna show you forgiveness, not just for you, but for the next generation. Think about that. Joseph's brothers have come to this place. 22 years went by, Joseph showed them forgiveness. The whole family is reunited. Jacob comes, he's filled with joy and gratitude because his son is alive. The family is blessed, and then finally the day comes, 17 years later, where we find Jacob passes away. And his brothers revisit that moment of forgiveness. And in their mind, their brother only forgave them out of compassion for their father. In their mind, Joseph did this because he didn't want his his father, their father, but, but but someone that that Joseph dearly loved, he didn't want him to hurt anymore. And so his brothers begin to reminisce a little bit and they begin to say, I bet now that father's gone, Joseph's gonna kill us. In other words, Joseph had to show forgiveness at 22 years and he had to show forgiveness at 39 years. Meaning sometimes forgiveness is an ongoing process. It's something you do over and over and over. It's something you have to practice every day. Remember the story where Peter goes and tries to be the spiritual giant with Jesus, talking about how I'm gonna forgive seven times if somebody wrongs me, trying to compare himself to the rabbis of his day, which would forgive three times if someone wronged him, and Jesus says, nah, 70 times seven. 490 times a day, every 90 seconds. That's the level of forgiveness I'm calling you to. Every 90 seconds. If you're awake for 24 hours and somebody offends you 490 times, that's every 90 seconds. And you know what the disciples' response are? Is that they say, this is impossible, this is, this is too hard. And they say, give us more faith. And Jesus breathes on them and gives them the power to forgive. Because what you don't forgive, you relive over and over again. Number seven, and I'm done. Luke 6, 28, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. My final thought is not only do you forgive them, but if you're gonna drop that weasel in 2017, you've actually got to go to the next level 
and pray that God will bless them. Like Jesus, who's hanging on the cross, Bob, forgive them. They don't know how this impacted me. Bless them anyway. Like Stephen being stoned to death, who expresses forgiveness. Or like Joseph, who's, who goes through 22 years of pain before he finally gets out of it because of what his brothers did. They all got to the place where they not only forgave, but they became a blessing to the people that hurt them. John Calvin said, this kind of prayer is exceedingly difficult. But Jesus did it, Stephen did it, Joseph did it. And my prayer is that the, the same God that breathed on the apostles and gave them the power to forgive in 2017, anything that's been holding you back, anything that's been devouring your heart, that God would breathe on you and give you the power to forgive so you can soar like never before.